And then I went to talk to my roommates who I lived in a house with four other guys and they're all involved in the industry. And a couple of them work for major studios. Um, and one of them worked like in development. And I went and told him and, and was like, what do you think about this idea? And I'm expecting that they're going to kind of get it because they're, you know, I went and told one guy who was a former, a former football player and rugby player and was doing MMA at the time mm. and was working out himself. And I was like, what do you think? And he's like, no one's going to watch that. <laughs> they, they all said, There's, who does that? Who power lifts? Welcome to the Less Than Obvious podcast. I'm your host, Jim McDonald. Back in episode two of this season, I talked a little bit about West Side Barbell. My guest, Michael Fahey, has spent the last several years making a documentary about West Side. My guests to this point have all discussed how people tried to talk them out of their less than obvious decisions. This time, one of those negative Nellies was yours truly. I'm assuming that's going to be rare, but we'll see. Anyway, I did offer some encouragement. You'll hear all about it. We recorded this in Columbus the day after the sneak preview premiere. Let's jump into the conversation. My name is Michael Fahey. I am the director and producer of West Side vs. the World. And uh, I'm a documentary filmmaker. I tell stories. All right. How do we get into this situation? (laughs) (laughs) Me and you? Uh, Yeah, yeah, that'd be a good place to start. All right. Uh, you want to start from like how I found you? Yeah, yeah. That's that's that'd be fine. And then we can, then we'll get to this this crazy thing that I tried to talk you out of. Okay. Um, well, so I was working on a little vegan documentary, uh, Forks Over Knives, mm-hmm. and uh, we were in like a six hundred square foot one bed studio apartment, and I was an editor. So when the front door opened. I sat in the back of the room and I always wore a West side hoodie. Uh-huh. And of course, if you've seen, you know, any West side apparel, it's always got the backside of the nitro logo on the back. Right. And nitro is a pit bull. Yes. So it's doing a- like a deadlift. Right. Uh, using his collar. But, uh, the most noteworthy thing is that the reverse shot of it, nitro has some big ass balls. <laughs> <laughs> and so after a while, everyone said, you know, like, Mike, what's up with your your hoodie there? It's uh, it's a little obscene, you know, for the workplace. And that from there, I just started telling stories to people about you know about West Side and this crazy little place where this cultish little Yoda Yoda figure uh-huh. kind of managed these, uh, you know, basically lunatics who were the strongest people on earth. And um, I didn't think anything of it. You know, I was like a twenty two year old kid. I was. I was just trying to kind of like fake my way through being an editor and uh-huh. hope that what I was doing was passable and that they'd just keep me on. Uh, Cause that was a, a major concern and <laughs> obstacle with that, with that project. And um, they went through a couple editors of that, that, that. Project, yeah. Right? They, they went through probably like when I started, we had uh, this guy, uh, John O and he, he went on to work at the NFL network and basically the project had just run too long uh, um, he had to leave, you know, in, in the fall for the NFL season to go back to the NFL network. And then they brought in another guy. And of course the, the next guy, you know, he didn't know where any of the files were. So they had actually gotten rid of me and they had to bring me back to, Oh, they got just cause you were, were you there just oh, temporarily? I got, or? I got, I got kind of like laid off like seven times, seven times, seven times. Um, and I got brought back every time within, usually within a few days, because they they really, they didn't know how much stuff I was doing for them uh-huh. until they said, okay, we think we're done with, you know, the part that you work on. And, yeah. you know, thanks a lot. You did good work, you know, but this is the end of the road. And uh, so then I would go, you know, like, oh, shit, now what, I, what am I going to do? You know, I'd uh-huh. gotten that job through an internship. And now I'm just, you know, a kid from Florida out in L.A. with no real prospects and, you know, no real network or anything to fall back on. Uh I've only been out there a few months. And, uh, but lo and behold, they would bring the next guy in and he wouldn't know where any of the files were. And we had, you know, 200 hours of footage. And my job... Just a little bit is what you're saying, a little bit of footage. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, if you're going at, you know, 
40 hours a week to look at the footage, to figure out what you got. Uh That's five weeks of just looking at footage. And of course they don't want to pay an editor an editing rate. Right. Just to watch tapes for five weeks. Right. So they'd bring me back in and I would spend, you know, a month or so just showing, you know, showing the next guy where everything was. Mm -hmm. And as soon as he kind of got his bearings or at least as soon as they thought, Then they'd call me and say, you know, okay, well, you don't need to come in tomorrow. And, you know, thanks a lot. And uh, the first time they did that, I think the next guy, uh, I think he uh, quit after a couple days of not having me. So he was like, you know, my my job was a lot easier when I had this, you know, kid showing me where everything was. Uh Um, And now suddenly, because it was also, I got, you know, any project that I do, I get invested in and I... I would research and for that it was about, you know, a plant-based diet. I went plant-based and mm-hmm. I read up about it and stuff. So I knew all the content and it, you know, really taught me that like basic knowledge is, you know, people say like knowledge is power, like that, you know, sort of the guiding principle of like how my career has worked so far. I've mm-hmm. never really gotten jobs based on my skill level. <laughs> I've gotten, ba- I've gotten jobs based on my, you know, comfort and knowledge and relationships around the the content of whatever the project was. Yeah. Um, but so anyways, to flash forward, eventually they realized, uh, because every time an editor would quit or would say, you know what, I, I just, after a few days, you know, this isn't the project for me, they would always have to bring me back in and I would spend a week editing the film just to keep, you know, the wheels moving. Mm-hmm. And then they'd bring somebody new in and they'd go, okay, Mike, I think this new guy's got it. And the new guy would go away, you know, you know, I'm, I'm way too far behind in terms of learning what this movie's even about. To, you know, I can't find, I don't know where anything is in these interviews. I don't mm-hmm. know what, I don't know what the script is talking about. You know, mm-hmm. none of this makes sense to me because that was a very technical movie. Mm-hmm. And uh, so they kept bringing me back. And one day, I'm showing this new editor who the producers had worked with before. He was like an older, you know, he's a seasoned guy. He's a pro. And he he's listening to me explain where, you know, well, this tape is over here. And if you see here, we've got a grid system. And, you know, it's it's 18 different people, 200 plus hours of just interviews, another, you know, 50 hours of archival footage and stuff. And I'm explaining to him how to use this giant searchable spreadsheet that I had built. Mm-hmm. And he just turns to the producers and says, what happens whenever an editor walks out the door? And they said, what do you mean? And he goes, what do you all do? Like, what happens to my chair? And they said, well, we, we ask Mike to hop in and he kind of, you know, keeps things afloat. And he said, like, does Mike have any sequences in the movie? And they pulled one up and said, you know, yeah, this is his. And it was uh, it was this sequence about a firehouse, and he he watched it and he goes, "That's as good or better than everything else that's in your movie." He says, "So every time y'all go down, you put the kid in," and he he goes, "You know, and you can't keep an editor, but the kid keeps showing up." And he said, "Has the kid ever told you no?" And he said, "No." And he said, "So if you ask the kid to show up, the kid shows up." He goes, the kid's your editor. I don't know if you realize that or not yet. <laughs> and <laughs> so to so their chagrin, he kind of said, like, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to be working on this. But you know, your best advice is, you know, stick with the stick with the guy you got. He's he's doing well enough. Uh-huh. And um, I think for them, it was just hard to to see me as you know, they hired me on as an intern, you right. know, unpaid, and I had just worked my way up the ladder because I stuck and because I didn't have any other options. If you've never encountered it, Forks Over Knives is a documentary and advocacy film that promotes plant-based diets over animal-based diets. I cribbed that term advocacy film from the Wikipedia description, but I think it's an important note. I mean, let's face it, all documentary films have a point of view, and a lot of them have some advocacy baked in. Even if it's just the strong suggestion that you don't have all the facts and the film would like to provide some. I think this one had a little bit more baked in than your average documentary. 
And then uh, to flash forward how we met, one of the producers, uh, one of the skinny little vegans who had heard me tell these West Side stories, she uh, she ended up as a development exec at a big reality TV company. And uh-huh. um, from there, she said, you know, I was, I was just thinking the other day, we had a meeting with, I want to say it was like Spike or somebody, um, but they were talking about the kind of content that they were looking for and what was working for them. Mm-hmm. And it was, you know, these sort of hyper-masculine stories of, biker gangs and, and stuff like that. Right. And, you know, Sons of Anarchy was really big. And yeah. so all the networks are kind of chasing whatever else is hot. And um, she called me up all excited and was like, you know, that it, what they were talking about, it sounded a lot like the kind of stories you used to tell about this this crazy gym up in Ohio. And, mm-hmm. you know, do you do you think these guys, you know, what if we made you a producer and you, you on the, just on the like pitch? Mm-hmm. Um but and she's like, maybe then you could get a job on the show and you could kind of be like a liaison to, you know, help us interact with this world. And I was thinking about it. I was like, that that's really an awesome idea. But there's no way in hell Louie would go for it. Right. And I hadn't talked to Louie since I was like 12, but I knew better than to go in there. You know, I was like, I could have gotten a quick check for a week's worth of work and research, called Louie, pitched it to him, mm-hmm. and he would have said no. And I never would have been able to talk to them again. And, but the idea intrigued me so much, I started thinking, like, well, how could I make it happen? And that's when I thought about doing a documentary. And even still then, I didn't believe that that was, like, really possible. So mm-hmm. I started instead trying to look at, well, what other powerlifting gyms might be interesting but open to a reality show? Mm-hmm. And... um so I was still talking to the reality company and we were still trying to put something together. Um, and they weren't paying me or anything at this point. It was just like, if you can, if you can find something like that, then we'll fund the the sizzle and you can go out and you, mm-hmm. know, you can put that together. And, you know, they trusted me enough from working with her before. And I want to say it was like around like Thanksgiving and this is maybe like 2012, 2013. Mm-hmm. somewhere in there that I found um, on like the old like super training website, I found the sizzle reel from when y'all had tried to right. do something. From, from 2010. Yeah. And I think I put it out in like maybe, two, maybe 2012, something like that. Yeah. <clears throat> but so it was just, you know, randomly Google searching, you know, like powerlifting, reality TV, just trying to see if anyone had, had tried it in the space um, and trying to find you know, a gym that might have characters and might, you know, might have enough going on to, to constitute a reality show. It's funny because it was Spike that almost bought that. So. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's how it goes. It's usually like if, you know, they don't have many ideas. So if they find one that they like, (laughs) You know, they, they might not like the it, way yeah. that you did it, but they might like the way that the next guy did it. Yeah. Just, you know, sort of off, off the, off the podcast. I think that it was that they didn't like, they didn't want to work with that producer. And they, mm-hmm. so they tried to create a situation where that producer would leave so that they could work with somebody else. Yeah. <clears throat> I think that that was the deal. And then, and, and whoever you were talking to probably had a better shot, but they needed to have been there like two years earlier. If you hadn't heard the term before, a sizzle reel is a short, usually tightly edited video that is supposed to give the executives being pitched a reality show some idea what the show would actually be like. The one Michael's referring to is on my YouTube channel, and I'll put a link up in the show notes. It was shot in 2010 and posted in May of 2012, so it sounds like Michael must have watched it in November of that year. Most sizzles are about three to five minutes long. This one was a good deal longer, I think because nobody figured out how to make it work as a show yet, so they threw in a lot of angles in the hope that something would stick. Nothing ever really did, although it did get kind of close. It was an interesting journey, though, being involved in producing this. Any thought I'd had about reality being real was tossed out the window. We'd had to come up with outlines for a good chunk of potential first season shows, and if you're outlining something that hasn't happened yet, how can that be reality? On top of that, the producers came up with all sorts of crazy things that they wanted the cast members to do, most of which the cast members were not going to be excited about. Even though nothing came of it, it was still a bit of a dream come true for me to be involved in this particular project. I had been thinking about the idea of a powerlifting-based documentary or reality show as early as 2004. That was long before I'd even met any of the people that worked on this effort in 2010. 
Yeah. Um, and that's sort of how, like, you know, going through all of this, you know, I wasn't the first guy who tried to do something at Westside. Right. There were, I mean, there were multiple other people who who tried to do something. I know, like, their their names. I know about some of these people um, who went in there, you know, like, months before or, e- you know, even the year or two before mm-hmm. and tried to do something, and none of them lasted a day. And, you know, like, there was a story about, like, one guy who came in and he sat down and the first thing he did was he told Louis he was, you know, like a strong man, a strong man competitor. And mm-hmm. Louis asked him, like, how much do you weigh? And the guy said, 190. And Louis said, like, get the f out of my gym. <laughs> You're and, not a strong man competitor. I'm sorry. Yeah. And yeah. even though the guy was like, no, I'm an amateur, like, to Louis, you're not an amateur anything. You right. either you either are what you are or you aren't. Right. So, you know, don't tell me you're a strong man if you're not, you know, 6'4 and, you know, 380 plus. No, because you're not going to be successful. Lightweight strong man is it's yeah. a thing, but it's not really a thing. Yeah. It's a fun hobby. Yeah. But it, but pro level, I don't think so. Yeah. It's it's like I like playing basketball, but if I walked into Westside and said, I'm a basketball player, <laughs> Louie would say, you're either in the NBA or I never want to f***ing see you again. Right, right, yeah. You're not playing intramural basketball and coming to Westside. Mm-hmm. Before we get too much further, I want to recap a couple of things about Westside. Westside Barbell is the best-known powerlifting gym in the world. It's owned by Louis Simmons. The gym is free, but membership is by invitation only. Louis invented and patented some strength equipment over the years, including and maybe especially the reverse hyper. Sales of this equipment have made Louis pretty financially well off. And a reason that sometimes people want to become involved in reality shows is so that they can sell more of their products or make money or whatever. And Louis was not in need of that and was never going to be in need of that. So uh, it would be difficult to see him having agreed to something like a reality show. Also, when people use the term West Side, they're often referring to the training system that Louis developed. It's been used by powerlifters for a long time, thousands of them across the world, and also by athletes. Many strength coaches in many different sports have picked up Louis' methods, and many of them visit West Side Barbell and learn from Louis directly. And Louis has actually coached quite a few athletes and teams himself. So, something else to keep in mind. So, you came to me with the reality show idea? Um, I came to you and I didn't know whether I wanted to do a reality show or you wanted- or a documentary. I wanted to do just something in this space because mm-hmm. it was something that um I basically I was tired of being a gun for hire. Mm-hmm. And I was tired of working on other projects where I was always the low man on the totem pole. I always felt like um it, it was sort of an era within the industry where I was working for a lot of people who had come up, you know, before social media and before like digital cameras had gotten so cheap that right. everyone had one where people all had like one skill set, and you worked your whole career and you were, you were an editor or you were a shooter or you were a producer. And I came from a background of putting together music videos and, um, uh, you know, learning how to do every aspect because the price had dropped on everything. You know, I grew up with Final Cut on my laptop. Right. And I was going in and working with editors as their assist, and they had gone to school for Avid in the early 90s, and they were Avid certified, and they never learned how to use another program. Right. And I was coming in going, I know how to use Avid, Premiere, and Final Cut. Oh, and by the way, I know how to shoot on, you know, every digital camera platform there is. Right. Now, I wasn't great at any one thing, but I had this very wide skill set and I had this understanding of of how all these things sort of intersected. Mm-hmm. Um so I, you know, I was just tired of like being a PA or being you know, being an assistant editor and then or being an editor even and working with say like a producer who I felt like I I knew how a producer, you know, in this sort of age of technology should work to better integrate all these different elements. But they would say to me, oh yeah, but you're an editor. 
you know, and I go, well, but I, you know, I've, I read books. I, you know, I went out and produced my own stuff, mm-hmm. you know, small scale stuff. Again, a lot of music videos and short films and stuff like that to try and prove that, Hey, I can, you know, here's my camera work. It looks better than the guy that y'all are paying now, you know, and they'd, they'd still go, yeah, but you're an editor. And I go like, how many times do I have to do something else to show you that I'm something else? Mm-hmm. You know, how many times are you going to compliment me to say, yeah, that looks really good. You could do that. Um, so I was like, you know, no one's, no one's going to hire me into a producing position. So I need to figure out some way in which I can construct something or put something together where like, yeah, I might, I might, you know, fail on my face, but you know, if the project gets derailed, if it, if it happens, if it doesn't, it, it's because of, you know, my skills and what I bring to the table. And then if it all works, it's a showcase of what I can do. And, you know, now I can say, you know, see, I have the credits cause I created the credits. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so to go back to it, I don't, I, I think I was, I was more familiar with, with documentaries and I liked how you could really take your time and develop something mm-hmm. with a documentary. I mean, obviously this one, <laughs> we started talking in like late 2012 or 2013 and you know, it's 2018 now. And I started talking to Louie in 2014 and yeah. So when you, you, you have a better memory of the conversation than I do. When you pitched the idea to me, um, what did you say and what did I say? Um, uh, well, when I, I pitched it to you, I remember pitching it to you over the phone and, and you had um, said how, you know, you had, with Super Training, had basically gone through something very similar mm-hmm. and, and said, you know, like, you talked about some of the pitfalls of of working with the producers you all had worked with, where it was like a fish out of water type situation. And, you know, they kept mixing up things like bodybuilder and power lifter, right. you know, weightlifter. It was all just like, oh, you're just big, dumb guys. Right. And me as someone who, you know, when I was younger, I was an athlete and I had always sort of trained in a West side style. And, you know, I read powerlifting USAs and I watched all the old VHS tapes from Louie and stuff. So like I had the actual familiarity of like how intellectually driven the the program was and how, you know, it's, there's this big emphasis on like basic physics and that it's not just, you know, meatheads getting a pump, mm-hmm. um, turning, uh, overturning cars, yeah. um, carrying refrigerators. Yeah. I think you had told me a story about like, uh, that they wanted you all to go like all go get pedicures and they were just doing like, they did that. Yes. They shot yeah. that. Um, they, they, they rocked a car on the sizzle reel. Mm-hmm. The eight or 10 episode first season outline included, basically them buying a junk car and then guys from the gym turning it over, Mm -hmm. like just flipping it over, (laughs) you know, it's stuff like that. It's like, it was, it was, um, it was just disrespectfully constructed. They didn't understand the subject well enough. They were just looking for circus. Yeah. It's just all circus. Well, that, that kind of goes back to what we were, what I was talking about earlier in the, in front of the expo where like, if you have no basic knowledge about something and you, you have no education and you have no experience, but you have these images of what you think it is in your head. Right. And that's how like most reality TV is produced where these producers, like, cause I was working on sizzle reels for other companies and right. stuff um, too, in between bigger jobs. And I would see, you know, even the producer who reached out to me about creating a, a powerlifting project she was telling me how that week she had to come up with five different ideas. So basically, you know, there's five work days in a week. Every week she had to come up with an idea per day. So, you know, she clocked in at eight in the morning and would clock out at six at night. Mm -hmm. And in those, you know, in those 10 hours or so, she had to come up with an idea, find someone who would get on the phone commit to potentially shooting a sizzle and then on friday at the end of the day she had to pitch all these ideas so you're going you know and if you're that friday idea that means that you may have only gotten four hours of development 
Right. And and you were maybe one of I don't know how many hours, how many how many things that 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 person went through that week to try right. to come up with. They might have gone every day. They might have gone through fifteen to twenty ideas. Yeah, I, I used to know there was a, there used to actually be a metric that was that was published. I don't know what, how much mm-hmm. of an estimate it was, but like at sort of stage one for reality development, it was one out of one out of a hundred would would make it out of stage one, and then like. I think it was like one out of twenty five made it to set to to the next stage, and then it would get yeah. crazy tight. Like, yeah, a lot of people were committing to um, extended sizzle reels or or demonstration stuff, but not yeah. getting past that point. So, you started thinking about a West Side documentary, and everybody was universally supportive, right? <laughs> Uh huh. Exactly. So, <laughs> uh, uh, let me parse that. So, people who had any idea what would it would take to do it, how supportive were they? Not the general population who thought, "Oh, hey, that'd be a great." Oh, idea. even even the general population, there were a lot of you know, like, you know, I was still out in L.A. at the time, yeah. And I tried. I I was all excited, you know, that this person who I was like, you know, this small vegan you know yoga class going kind of hippie chick (laughs) that she thought there was potential in a story that i had told her years earlier Uh and when i met up with her she could still remember a lot of the story right so i was like okay that says a few things like number one i'm apparently a good enough storyteller i'm I'm not gonna say great but i'm gonna say good enough Uh that it stuck that I could at least do that story justice enough to make someone who has no interest in it remember it. Right. And then number two, the story itself is good enough that it had the elements necessary to stick with someone mm. who had no crossover. This, is, this wasn't trying to convince somebody from, you know, London, Ohio, who had grown up, you know, 20, 30 minutes away from mm-hmm. West Side hearing stories. This was this was a girl from Simi Valley who, you know, I don't know if she'd ever been to Ohio. I don't know if she'd ever had a gym membership. And, you know... Outside of a yoga studio. Yeah. And, and she'd only just started doing yoga. Like, that was... <laughs> her athletic background was, like, six months of, you know, That's once great. every couple weeks, yoga. That's great. Um... But uh, beyond that, you know, like, uh, I, so I, that all clicked in my head that like there, there's potential here. Uh-huh. And then I went to talk to my roommates who I lived in a house with four other guys and they're all involved in the industry. And a couple of them work for major studios. Um, and one of them worked like in development. And I went and told him and, and was like, what do you think about this idea? And I'm expecting that they're going to kind of get it because they're, you know, I went and told one guy who was a former a former football player and rugby player and was doing MMA at the time Mm. and was working out himself. And I was like, what do you think? And he's like, no one's going to watch that. (laughs) They they all said, there's who does that? Who power lifts? Who power lifts? Like no one does that. And I was like, well, if you go to the gym, like there's, there's like five or six guys in every gym. And I started, I was like, just think there's like 10 gyms and we were living in Pasadena. And I was Uh like, there's like 10 gyms in Pasadena. So there's got to be 150 gyms in in LA. There's got to be more than that. Yeah. Really? There's there's probably like 200 gyms and 250 gyms in the LA metro area at least. Yeah. And I was like and at every single one of them there's at least a few people there who power lift. There's a few in the morning, there's a few in the evening. There's probably, you know, just as many who come in at 3 in the morning cuz they're antisocial. Like the numbers have got, I was just doing the math in my head. I was like, there's got to be a market. Mm -hmm. And from Forks Over Knives, I'd heard similar arguments as far as like, you know, well, who's vegan? Right. Who cares about plant-based diet? And I was like, you got to remember too. I was like, I was a, I was a football player. I was a, a track athlete. I never competed in powerlifting. And I trained with 10 other kids who never competed in powerlifting. Yeah. But we all knew about Louis Simmons. We all knew about Chuck. Mm-hmm. We all knew about Dave Tate. We all heard these names. We all saw the the pictures from Powerlifting USA. We all watched the v- VHS tapes. And I was like, so I come from Florida where everyone plays football. Right. And I was like, 
if you can convince these football players that may you know a it's hardcore so maybe they're they're a little predisposed to it but like also that maybe like you can learn from these strongest men on the planet in a way that'll help you you know get a scholarship uh-huh. there's a massive market and people just sort of like looked at me like I was crazy and refused to kind of connect these dots but I had already seen with Forks Over Knives you know two or three years earlier that the way that that movie took off that you know there were they estimated with that there was a million vegans at the time in the US jeez and that's more than I would have guessed at the time but yeah it was probably and it's probably a very high estimate yeah. but out of 330 million people that 1 million of them were vegan and then they estimated that 10 million of uh 10 million out of 330 were either vegan or vegetarian uh-huh. So I was like, well, think about it the same way. Let's say that there's 100,000 powerlifters out there, including like your amateur and hobby guys who mm-hmm. maybe compete once every few years. Scale that up. How many, how many people out there are football players? Well, you got a couple million kids who are, who are playing football at some level, you mm-hmm. know? And then how many are, you know... It, then CrossFit was starting to rise and stuff. So I was like, there's all these people who every lay, every level out, they're a little less likely to to care. Mm-hmm. But they're still more likely to care than just your average dude off the street. But at every level out, it grows exponentially. Pre-CrossFit, I think that Dave Tate used to estimate the market at 20,000. Yeah, but again, I think it seemed that like that might that might be low, but yeah, I I think that's I think he, that's like I think he was estimating like a very sort of and I've talked to him about it. I think that's a very sort of like an estimate of like people who potentially might find something like elite, mm. which is a resource that you've got to be more than just sort of casually into. Yeah, it. Yeah, that's like that's true. And the guys who end up, you know. There's more people who end up like trying powerlifting for, or that style of training for mm. six months and then move on. Right. The guys, I think he's more concerned with the guy, and I think his metrics are more reflective of like the people who get into the sport and stay into the sport. Yeah, I think they're somewhat more conservative. So I was like super like behind this idea from the beginning, right? Oh yeah, you, <laughs> <laughs> you, you kind of just like heard me out and let me talk, pretty much like this, <laughs> and <laughs> and then I think at one point you asked me like if there was anything else that I was doing, and I was like, <laughs> no, nothing really. That's kind of the problem is I have all this free time right now because I'm just between jobs and gigs and I don't have money, and um, and you were just like, yeah, well, I, I, you know, I don't think I don't think this is you know, and it wasn't even with power or with West side. It was like just generally with powerlifting. It was like, well, if you're going to do that, that's, that's probably a, a difficult job to do. Uh, and West side, Oh, that definitely won't happen. Yeah. Um, I was pretty, I was pretty down on that possibility. Yeah. And then you, uh, you even gave me, uh, you gave me, Chris Bell's email Mm -hmm. and I emailed back and forth with him a little bit about it. And he even said, and I was like, well, you know, they were in bigger, stronger, faster. And, and he even emailed me back and was like, don't do it. Don't, it's not worth it. They're not good on camera. You know, like it's, there's, you know, like Louis, the biggest pain in the ass I've ever had to, had Mm -hmm. to shoot. I, I kind of came away from that like, well, that was cool in the sense of like, I just started, I just found you all on YouTube and mm-hmm. I saw the following that like your channel and Super Training's channel were starting to get. Mm-hmm. And it more solidified in my mind that there was this this market. And uh, right around that time, I, I think like the YouTube fitness industry really started to like boom, mm-hmm. uh, at least in the on the powerlifting side of things, which is the only side that I really followed. Um, but so even as you all were telling me, no, I was looking at your analytics and going like, no, there's, there's something here. Like if I could, if I could make something about that, like people would care. And again, the, the, the thing that the common thing that like you had said about the reality process was 
how none of the producers understood. Right. And yeah. they were trying to manufacture this drama. Right. And I had seen that on other sizzles that I'd worked on where, you know, they're, they're trying to make every sizzle into the same sizzle. Yeah. And again, that idea that they... All, all the tropes are the same. Yeah. And it's because they they don't know anything about any of the things that they're trying to make shows on. Mm-hmm. So it all falls back onto they have like three tricks up their sleeve, and they're going to try to dr- try to just jam them into yeah. every every project they work on. Yeah, and it and it does revolve around the fish out of water or um, or or just being people being rude. Yeah, and it just it, nothing that would ever reflect well on anybody involved. <laughs> right. And I didn't, I just didn't think that it would, that you, I, I knew what we had gone through mm-hmm. and I knew that, that getting the understanding was really hard. And I, yeah. and um, having the image control was really mm-hmm. challenging. And I figured that considering where we were at the time and how we felt about image, that it would be multiplied at West side. Oh yeah. And so th- the idea that, that Louie would go along with it, especially since West Side is um, maybe one of the least uh, actually f- photographed or filmed mm-hmm. gyms, especially these days. But, but yeah. even back then, it just like outside of Louie's uh, VHS tapes, mm-hmm. like how much footage was there shot at, at West Side before? So, and, and, and to me, that always felt like, oh, that's a control thing. Like we yeah. don't want anybody to see what we're doing. Like we're doing stuff that's different. We don't want you to know what it is. And you can't. And if <laughs> if you can't figure out how to get here, then you don't get to know. Yeah, but well, I think there was a lot of that. Well, my whole thing was what I was looking at was in the same way that I, you know, had seen on the other sizzles that I'd worked on, how they would use again those same few tricks and and fish out mm-hmm. of water and you know just generally being like sort of mean spirited Mm -hmm. and cynical towards things for no reason at all. I had known, I had known powerlifters and I had known, like I had knew, I knew Dave Tate, Mm -hmm. not really well, but I had spent enough time around him to see, you know, kind of what powerlifting had done to him. And I think that that's really like reflective in the movie. Um, and, that I've made now of when I looked at it, the int- the things that were interesting to me were sort of, it was what these guys were willing to do to do the, th- you know, to achieve the things that they wanted to achieve mm-hmm. and why they wanted to achieve it. Because it wasn't, it wasn't for glory. It was, you know, and it, even if it was, it was, that's an, an entirely like misguided notion because Ultimately, everyone was right. Nobody does care about powerlifting. Right. You know, there's no money. There's no powerlifters aren't famous. You know, maybe here at the Arnold, but like even then, I watched, you know, tons of great powerlifters today walk through the crowd without getting noticed mm-hmm. at all. You know, like, and I, and then YouTube fitness personalities walk through and they get mobbed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's true. And I, I, th- I think that the deal is that people care that people care about what they're doing. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily care about the thing that that person cares about. So it's like, what, what are they willing to give up? What is their emotion around it? What, um, how long can they actually keep doing it? Like what's their, what's their stamina relative to, uh, pursuing a particular goal, all that stuff, that human drama that translates across kind of all, all undertakings, all, all human undertakings. I think people can identify with that stuff yeah, uh, without necessarily caring about, about powerlifting or any, anything else. Right. Well, that, that's sort of the thing that I've always believed is that there are, you know, across any, across any idea or any story, you know, there's, there's the old like notion that they teach you in school that there's only like five stories or seven stories or whatever it is that really that everyone, you know, every movie is, is really just some slight variation of, of these same few core stories. Yeah. And that's really true. Like there's, we all like live in a different place and in a different 
in a different spot in time. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, we all we all go through the same problems. It's just that the variables being input into those problems are slightly different. So our outcomes, you know, create all these wild variations. But it's the same core problem. But so when when they start talking about you know a reality show or or an idea for a documentary the part that interest interested me was you know that struggle bet- with Louis between you know coach and athlete mm-hmm. and i was like you know espn pays big money for documentaries about how kobe and phil didn't get along right or how you know michael jordan punched steve kerr like Guys who have never played in the NBA, guys who have never played, you know, in middle school, you know, all line up and, and watch these movies about every other sport. And I said, you could give the same treatment to powerlifting. People don't need to be a powerlifter mm-hmm. or they don't need to be advanced or know a whole lot about it. And there's plenty of movies that have already proved that premise. So I was like, the the story that I wanted to tell was since I had seen powerlifters and I'd seen powerlifting and I'd seen old powerlifters, mm-hmm. I had seen guys who were worn down. Um, I had seen, you know, I had seen guys, you know, with bloody pecs from, <laughs> from you know, blowing something off. Like yeah. that was the part that was fascinating to me. It wasn't what everyone thought that powerlifting was. It was what I had seen powerlifting do to people. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that, and to tie that back to West Side, there's no other environment where people so consistently, you know, you'll find in Ed Cohn, you'll find, you know, uh, a great lifter here and there who's given everything that he has to the sport. But generally, you go to that gym and there's one legend there, or maybe there was a second guy who was there for a while. But you don't find an entire ecosystem devoted to everyone giving every last ounce that they have to the same pursuit. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't get sort of like amplified the same way. And that's what I saw with Westside. And And the the thing at the time, and we were having these conversations, I thought, God, he's just got, okay, he's so young, number one. (laughs) Yeah. And number two, he's got so much passion for this thing. And number three, this, this is never going to work. There's just, it's just like, this is a, this is a bad idea. This is never going to work. It, and, and number four, he's going to get hurt in this process. And I don't know, like he, he's so idealistic about it. If he gets hurt in this process, like what is, like, what is he going to do next? Like, how is he going to rebound from this? Because it's going to hurt. I mean, it's going to be really painful. If I was being protective of Michael in this circumstance, it wasn't because I didn't think he was capable. Given all the obstacles, I thought maybe his focus and energy would be better spent on a different project with a better chance of success. To be fair, there's probably a fifth factor here that has mostly to do with me. I have a tough time wrapping my mind around really huge dream projects, although I admire the people who can. The best I can usually muster is a series of dreams that start small and get ever so grudgingly, incrementally, marginally larger. I like bite-sized, tangible accomplishments, plenty of opportunities to take their universe's temperature on the value of my project before I keep moving forward. So I think at some point I said, all right, so if you're going to try to do this, Mm -hmm. try to construct it in such a way that you know you have Louie on a chain for most of it. Uh Like, you got to get him to agree to let people say things, bad things about him. You have to let people criticize him. Yeah. uh, Both his method and himself. Mm -hmm. And you have to be able to talk to those people and um, you, you have to play the underdog card with him. You have to... Mm -hmm get him to buy in on the fact that his his gym though it's the the strongest gym in the world it's still an underdog because yeah. they're still fighting against all of their you know lifting foes and people's attitudes and all that stuff yeah and then very specifically you said it has to be west side versus the world right and you know then from from that conversation i immediately got offered to do something else right and 
switched gears entirely. And then when that fell apart, um, and I came back to, to trying to do this, that had stuck with me for some reason. And mm-hmm. I was creating like, uh, you know, a, a prospectus for investors and stuff and, and trying to, you know, get other people kind of on board with some resources behind me, which was in itself a very unsuccessful process for <laughs> a long, long time. Um, but I said, you know, the working title would be West Side versus the World. Uh-huh. Um, Which I didn't know for quite a while, as a matter of fact. I don't think you told me until until you were nearly, you know, at a green light point with the movie. Yeah. Well, I, I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to tell you like, yeah, I think I'm going to use that name <laughs> and then turn around and, you know. And like, have, it, have it called, you know, Louis Pitbulls or something. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the another title that I had. I had uh, thought about um, and really liked, uh, but it didn't, it didn't explain enough sort of uh, about the movie, you know, West side versus the world. It has West side in the title. Right. Right. Which that's, that's worth a lot. That's big. Yeah. Um, so when you're just scrolling by, you, you know, you have at least some semblance of, you know, it's easier for people to find. Yeah, exactly. Um, they, have, they immediately can shorthand to what it might be about. Yeah. Uh, then the other title that I thought about was uh, Dead Game. Okay. Or, or Dead Game Dogs, um, which kind of goes back to uh, something that Louis said to me that it's not in the, it didn't end up making the film, but... Louis made this analogy to me about um, when I said, you know, like, what do you look for in a lifter? And he asked me if I knew what a dead game dog was. And uh, I've never heard this expression before. Go on. Yeah, neither had I. Uh, it comes from dog fighting. Um, okay. Which I never saw any dog fighting. <laughs> so no, no um, dogs were harmed in the making of this podcast. Uh, yeah, Louis. Louis has. He's always had like sort of American pit bull breeds mm-hmm. and. Um, he, his affinity for him goes all the way back to like Spanky and the, the sort of World War II era imagery of, you know, America's dog, the pit bull. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, much sort of like DMX, his, his best friend was always his dog. Right. And, uh, but he, he said, you know, do you know what a dead game dog is? And I said, no. And he goes, that's the ones that'll fight to the death. Like that's the, uh, that's the dog that, that won't basically, that's the dog that won't back down. Yeah. That's the dog that has no quit in it. Uh, and it's a very brutal metaphor and it, you know, comes from a, from a, a brutal a, a, sport, a, from yeah. a, a brutal blood sport yeah. and, uh, something that certainly I, I don't condone or <laughs> in any way. But you can understand what he's, he's describing. Yeah. I think it also, um, something that's in the movie is the fact that the only people who have their pictures on the wall at West Side are people who are dead. And yeah. That, and that reminds me of the scene at uh, Poncho's Happy Whatever Writing Club, Happy Bottom Writing Club, from um, The Right Stuff. Mm-hmm. The pilots oh, would come in all the time and, and say, it was out in the desert uh, near mm-hmm. the the Air Force Base in the high desert where they tested all the the new jets. Oh yeah. Yeah. At the bar, there was all of these pictures yeah, yeah, behind yeah. No, the bar. I, I have actually seen that. The pilots would say, Oh, I'll have my picture up there someday. And it's like, do you know what it takes to get your picture up there? And they, no, you have to die. Yeah. These are the, these are the pilots that die. It's interesting to me that West side would have that same kind of rule. Yeah. It's, um, <laughs> it's, it's one of those things where like, you don't even know where to start with it because it, it, explains so much it explains so much about the gym and about the personality of it and the philosophy of it and louis ideals and and philosophies and his his basic morals and stuff for him sort of the pursuit of ultimate greatness in one area is one of the like highest sort of moral pursuits you know there's there's like no greater testament to that than you were willing to die to do this thing that you strive to be great at. And to, to you know, the average person, that seems utterly insane. But but if you love ancient stories, mm-hmm. it, it's, it fits right in there. 
if you think about it, the, yeah, the, the stories, that archetypal stories that that uh, that you were talking about earlier, in terms of just like TV shows or whatever, the, the, all those things have been around for a really long time, and the thought that someone would want uh, so much to achieve a particular thing, whether it's some pursuit of perfection or trying to build a thing or raise a great army or any of those things that they would be so committed, they'd be committed to the death Mm -hmm. to do it. And that, that Louis Simmons would be a guy that would be one of those epic heroes (laughs) <laughs> and uh, you know hero anti-hero i think it comes down to ultimately like what your sensibilities are whether he's a hero or an anti-hero or and i tried to i tried to sort of portray both sides of that within the movie and acknowledge sort of the good and the 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 bad or the 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 just and the unjust and my friend John Romanello is a big fan of Joseph Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces and archetypes in storytelling in general. He's a guest on this show later in the season, and I thought he might have more insight into what I was getting at here, so I asked him this question. Is there an off-the-shelf archetype for a character who is willing to sacrifice and even die while attempting to meet a purely personal, non-altruistic goal? His answer... I would say any athlete falls into that to some degree. I looked up the whole family of athlete archetype descriptions, and the generic definition included maybe too much of a self-preservation component to be spot on. Looking through the list, the only one with a real at-all-cost theme was called the cheater. So, more you know. I don't don't want to steal the movie's thunder at all and get too much into the... um too much into the the kind of insight that you get that you that I never had before mm-hmm. about about that that level of commitment within the gym. I'll just say this that that when you see the movie, you you get it. Mm-hmm. You understand what these guys were willing to do and what Louis always had in his mind about it. Mm-hmm. The standard he had in his head and his so so completely driven by that standard. Yeah, I mean it's it's something where like it's only over the last really only over the last like maybe month or two months even that I've I started to realize like how how much my thought process I don't know if it 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 changed or I just realized how in how many ways I kind of like empathized with how Louis viewed things. But once, like, sort of, once you understand his, like, basic logic, Mm -hmm. nothing he does really is that mysterious. Um, He just doesn't, he just doesn't tell people everything that's happened to him that goes into why he does things the way that he does. Um, So people, you know, judge him against their own you know, their own upbringing and their own life experience. Mm -hmm. And of course it's going to be, you know, non-congruent with, with their, you know, sort of morals and ethics and expectations. Right. But it it was something where, and especially over the, over the last few weeks, I'd wondered how to handle like a lot of the different arguments and criticisms of West side Mm -hmm. and something that consciously over the last couple of weeks, I'd, I, I was like, well, I don't want to. I don't want to present this in a way that is overly defensive, or is overly critical, or. And I, I started to realize, like, really, I guess the way to make it make sense is to present it through the perspective of the guys who are who are at Westside in terms of how they view the problems, mm-hmm. so that when you hear the when you hear criticisms from the outside, whether they're right or wrong, you understand how the decisions coming out of West Side are filtered through their viewpoint. Mm-hmm. To be short, a lot of it just dealing with raw versus equipped lifting mm-hmm. and and some of the phrases within that, not to have an argument about like, well, who's stronger, the raw guy or the geared guy, or or who's who's the best or anything, but to to have that argument over like, why do these guys care about the lifting that they do, especially for a guy like Louie, who Louie's not on the internet. Louie doesn't, 
Right. Louis doesn't know who everyone's favorite USAPL lifter is or anything. Right. Like he, he doesn't. He's the last person to care too. Yeah. But yeah, one thing I've wondered is, uh, you know, I've I've talked to you from the beginning because you, aside from just being a nice guy, <laughs> you, uh, and and you know, being generally helpful and supportive, uh, even when you're trying to steer me away from this, <laughs> <laughs> which, uh, kind of to go back to that, like when you're when you're saying you know like oh he's so he's so idealistic and stuff, I think a lot of people they they feel like that about me. Mm-hmm. And they don't realize, like, I see all the danger. Maybe you pick that up now, but, like, I know what I'm walking into. And I may have, like, an insane sort of delusional disbelief that, like, it really can hurt me or that, you know, it can, it can, getting hurt isn't, isn't a problem for me. I can, I can get through getting hurt. Like, if I believe that I can literally survive it, then it's not that much of a price to pay if I can get to the other side. So with all the difficulties of West Side, I mean, I went in there knowing, like, hey, Louie doesn't want to be interviewed. I went in there knowing, like, there's a reason no one's done, you know, you're not the first guy to have this idea. Mm-hmm. You're not the first guy to try. Right. Everyone else has been kicked out. This is not, not going to be easy. This is going to be trying. This is going to be hard. I went in there knowing all of this. Now I didn't know how hard it would be. <laughs> I didn't know, and I didn't know what kind of you know conflicts I would have. <laughs> what kind on, of hard? It would be. Yeah. Um, but I I wasn't like it, it's it sort of, and I've gotten that before in the just in the way that I've generally approached a lot of things where people think like I must be really naive mm-hmm. to to be walking into the situation. Well, I think that most people. If when they walk into a difficult situation, are doing it, are willing to do it because they're naive of of what the actual situation is and a, all the potential outcomes. Yeah. Most people, yeah. But what you're saying is that you had done all the analysis, you looked at all the pros and cons, and decided that somehow, for some reason, the pros outweighed the cons. Yeah. Well, it's and and that you had minimized in your mind what damage there would be. If it didn't work out. Yeah. Or if even if it did. <laughs> we'll get to yeah, that in a there's, second. <laughs> there's a, you know, it's it's sort of like I empath on that general sense, I empathize a lot like with Louis, you know, and, and how he's like dealt with injury. Mm-hmm. Where, you know, Louis broke his back and for 99% of people, they would go, okay, well, that's, this is where I stop now. That was too far. Yeah. Most and people. for that one percent of people, they go, okay, well, I'll keep going. For ninety nine percent of the one percent, if you broke your back again, you were definitely done. Yeah, because you'd be afraid of being crippled for the rest of your life, right? But for Louis and for a very, very select few people, you know, or, or to say even to look at like Tom Brady now when he's you know in his forties and mm-hmm. saying he wants to play five more years. Which is insane. Anyway. Which which is insane. But like to him, he's going like the idea of stopping at a certain point is that's ultimately arbitrary. Mm-hmm. That's uh, do people stop because they have to stop? They can't go further, or just because they're unwilling to go further? And so I look at a lot of obstacles sort of in the same way, and you know I smile through it and I joke about it and. I don't think that people, they, I think people think like they, he, he just must not know what he's about to do. <laughs> like he's just got to be a fool. And the reality is, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just pretty sure that like it may hurt, but I'll, I'll survive. Uh-huh. And even if I don't survive at a certain point, like, well, then that won't hurt. <laughs> like <laughs> when it's over, it's over. Yeah. yeah so, so what were the craziest experiences of filming this that you're willing to share? Because oh. I'm I'm gonna let you I'm gonna let you self censor. Um well, they, <laughs> aside from aside I don't wanna, from, I don't wanna hang you out there too far. Yeah, but. aside from uh certain things that I don't know if I like 
can talk about. That's what I'm saying, yeah. yeah. I, um, I, I know you've told me a couple of things <laughs> that I, I, I don't think I'm comfortable with having you repeat just yeah. because of the amount of attention it would draw. Anyway, yeah, go maybe on. in <laughs> maybe a year down the road. Yeah, there's, yeah. There's a whole lot more things that I could talk about. Yeah. Um, <sighs> gosh, uh, the craziest things. Um, man, that is, that's so hard to think. <laughs> there are so many things that I, I don't know, like if I can talk about. <laughs> and those are the craziest things. Um, I guess one of the, one of the, it wasn't the craziest thing, but one of the sort of the most difficult and the most unexpected things was when I finally got Louie to agree to let me move forward with it that I show up to the gym with a camera and I had actually been I'd come to the gym one day with the camera and had uh shot with uh like Louie and Greg Panora mm. um and it's a scene that's not in the movie that you know Greg and Louie hadn't spoken for you know probably like six or seven years at that point Jeez. Uh, but they both talked about each other as if they had. So I'm showing up. I'm bringing Greg to the gym, and and uh, or actually he had picked me up, and you know we drove in the same car over to the gym. But he's coming over, and I think that he and Louis have reconnected a long time ago. And mm-hmm. Louis was the one who gave me, you know, to go back to you saying like you have to do it in a way where Louis, you know, willing to kind of have the, the bad as well as the good come out. Right. That weirdly was never a problem. And even guys who were in the movie were really shocked at what Louis would, what Louis allowed me to do. Uh-huh. Um, Louis never, Louis never vouched for the movie. Uh huh. He, he didn't go down to the gym and say, Hey guys, this is Michael. He's going to, He's going to come interview us and don't worry, he's okay. He didn't do that. Yeah. I if I wanted to talk to somebody in the gym who was going to probably talk glowingly about Louie, I had to go make the the connection myself. But for some of the guys who were outside of the gym, Louie gave me a list of names and said, you know, here's some guys you might want to contact, here's some phone numbers. It was just like five or six names. Greg was one of those names. And they hadn't spoken for seven years. And so... I, I call Greg and and Greg was shocked that you know he's well why are you why are you calling me like what's this project gonna be and I was like well Louis gave me your number and he's like really and you know so we get to talking and then uh, eventually you know we went and we we talked to Matt Winning and they had their falling out and mm-hmm. they're, they're kind of they're separate things now and and Matt asked me you know like well where'd you you know who who recommended me like I'm I'm kind of surprised that. Because you know, it was also, it was very early in the process. And uh-huh. I, I said, well, Louie gave me your number. And. That's amazing to me. Yeah. Well, it just shows you how, how, uh, the extent to which I misjudged how he would react. Yeah. That, that, that I mean, because that was a major component for me. Yeah. Because I said, you can't make this a complete love letter to Louie and Westside because a lot of people in the powerless community will not buy that because they're not fans of Westside. Well, you don't, with the, in the final movie, you don't have to be a fan of Westside to understand that Louie was holding things to a particular standard and other people were trying to hold on to that, to hold themselves to that standard mm-hmm. to the point that they couldn't anymore. Yeah. Uh, and it didn't have anything to do about Louie protecting his ego. Right. And, and that's, that was, I didn't, I, I had no, I, I mean, when he gave me like a list of names and stuff, there was honestly on that, on that list, thinking back now, I haven't thought about this. I don't think there was a single name on that list who didn't, who wasn't surprised. There was one person who was on the list and didn't know that they were on the list because they knew me uh, oh. outside of the movie. I was going to talk to them anyways, uh. but they had no idea that Louis had had said like, "Oh, you should talk to him." And you know, he didn't he didn't like he wouldn't add any other further description to it. And the way that Louis talks about everything is kind of without any emotion and without it. Right. There's no gravity to anything that right. he says. It's ri- he barely emotes. 
um, so he's extremely difficult for people to read. And I think people end up projecting a lot of their, you know, when there's a, a complete lack of emotion on his side, I think everyone else kind of just fills it with whatever they feel and, or whatever they fear that he feels. He does feel things. He just doesn't express it. So no one really knows how he reacts to hardly anything. There's very few people who, who know him on any kind of really personal level. Even within the gym now, there's, there's very few guys who, who I feel like have any real read on him. That's a particularly interesting facet of the movie. Mm -hmm. Is it, is it uh, as time passes and those people pass through the gym who actually do understand Louis well enough to be able to communicate Louis's ideas and thoughts and hopes and, and aspirations for different people in their, in their own words based on what Louis is saying? Yeah. Uh, that 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 was particularly informative to me. Yeah, but I guess that all goes back to uh, what I was saying a few minutes ago. That I was interested to know because you, you know, even when we walk through the through the Arnold today, like everybody knows Jim. Yeah. Um, and you, <laughs> and you, uh, you know, from the very beginning, you you were someone like I I spoke to. At first, because it seemed like, well, wow, this guy, like, you were in tune with the, the powerlifting community. Because mm -hmm. I had I had followed it up through high school. Mm -hmm. And then in 2005, I go, to away, I go away to college. And I see my dad once every couple weeks. And he still talked to me about lifting and stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, eventually came to me and was like, oh, man, I heard Chuck left the gym. And, you know, and I was just like, really? Oh, wow. You know, like, but I didn't follow up on any of it. Yeah. And then when I start talking to you, I remember I asked you, like, you know, so what is West Side's, like, image like and stuff? And, uh -huh. and you're like, oh, well, it's not. They're, like, they've kind of fallen out of favor. Yeah. And Raw had just popped up. And, right. And so this, it was weird because as young as I am, I was attached to, like, this world that predated my generation. Uh-huh. It was it was just shocking to me, like what had happened to the the whole sort of powerlifting scene. That it was growing so fast, and it was dominated by younger people, and then so many of them had no concept really of the history of the sport, which was weird to me because I didn't, as I said, like I didn't participate in the sport, but I just by virtue of being around my dad, who was so much into it, who also didn't participate in the sport, which was weird, <laughs> uh, who was just such a big fan that I had absorbed all of this knowledge and, and sort of cultural information. And now it was like all of that had just been washed away. Like it was like sandcastles on a beach or something. Yeah. And I was, I was just so like shocked by all of that. But so I started talking to you and, and you, you seem to like know where, or at least definitely compared to me, you, you knew you knew everybody and you knew, oh, well, this is what's popular now. And this is how like most people are kind of training. And these are the, you know, these are the popular federations. And mm -hmm. this is, this is kind of where the sport is going now. And by virtue of who you were around and stuff and, you know, how long you've been around things, you, you knew all these people, mm -hmm. you were familiar with all these people. And so you're a resource in that sense. But now looking back, uh, now that I've spent so much time up close to West Side, how well how well going into to all this? Because I knew that, I knew that along the way that there were things that I told you about, you know, like Louis that you didn't know. Yeah. How how much had you uh, had much interaction with with Louis or, or with been Louis? To... Um, I had met Louis a number of times. Mm -hmm. um, I never hung out with Louis for very long. Yeah. Uh, well, no one really does. Nobody really does. But I, but I knew a lot of people who had spent a lot of time talking, talking to Louis. Uh -huh. um, I knew a lot of people who had had epic telephone conversations with Louis over the years. Mm -hmm. I knew Dave Tate relatively well at yeah. the time. This was actually a really good question that I don't think I gave a very good answer to. So thinking back on it, here's a better one. 
When Michael and I first talked, I had been reading Louis' stuff and watching his tapes for quite a while, a while before I'd spent over a year in a gym where Louis was basically worshipped as a god and trained with somebody who had, who had trained at Westside for a period of time. And then at the point that I was talking to Michael, I was training regularly with someone who had lifted at but never competed for Westside. I often heard stories from inside the gym, never really knowing where they stood on the scale between true and apocryphal. It's important to note that Louis is one of those people that that people like to quote and talk about all the time. Sometimes it's the way an assistant talks about a boss, like, you know, Mr. Simmons doesn't like chives, whether or not the boss had really ever expressed a preference. I think that there are plenty of appeal to authority type arguments being made where people were trying to make Louis's words their words, and at times their words into Louis's words. Anyway, I remember there being some behind-the-scenes story or situation at the time that had me thinking that I was probably on the right track with what I said to Michael at the time, and I think that it doesn't really matter so much because I think it had the right effect whether or not it was exactly squared with reality. What I was absolutely correct about was that geared powerlifting, the kind preferred by Westside Barbell and Louis Simmons, was definitely falling out of favor. I know this because I was involved in shooting some of the raw lifting that became very popular at a turning point in, say, I don't know, 2009, I believe, when Stan Efferding was involved in the gym. Uh, it seems to me that that is one of, the, one of the touchstones, one of the points in time that things began to change. Mm-hmm. I knew Dave Tate relatively well at yeah. the time. Uh, and I knew kind of his take. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's a strange dynamic. I don't know if I'm really this part in it or not. It's a strange dynamic between the two of them because... Uh, yeah, well, he was he's the one that I was talking about in yeah. terms of like, he knew that I was going to talk to him. Oh, uh, okay. And he did not know that Louis had said, you should talk to him. Yeah, because, because Louis, w- I mean, because Dave was sort of the first big translator. Mm-hmm of of Louis's methodology mm-hmm. and and that really worked for him let's just mm-hmm. say i think that 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 was his first it was his first foray into building a platform for mm-hmm. himself i think was was based on being able to communicate conjugate in a way that that more people could understand it yeah elite started before that but but to really become popular and mainstream Mm-hmm. You have to have a platform and a, and, a, and a point of view, and his translation of of West Side into something people can understand was was really huge for him. So yeah, you know, some people might say he owns owes his success to Louis, and I think that he owns his success to uh, being able to understand Louis and having had the stamina to to bring it all together. That's yeah, you know, I mean, you can you can you can understand something and not be able to to commercialize it. I right. Mean, let's let's face it. What I'm saying about Dave is this. Back in 1998, Dave created Elite Fitness Systems. From the beginning, I think most powerlifters thought of Elite as the primary place to buy the powerlifting gear, bands, chains, eventually racks, just all the equipment that complemented Louis' training system. Elite also offered a great deal of free information, and much of that was focused on breaking down Louis' training system into chunks that most people can understand. This was important because Louis is a crazy genius. Much of what he says about training is on another level and not easily understood or correctly applied by the masses. Dave had the ability to break these things down through articles, his website, seminars, etc. And in my mind, the relationship among Dave, Louis, and Louis' training system in those early years is a remarkable example of synergy, though I hate that word from my time in the corporate world, but it is much greater than the sum of its very powerful parts. I should also throw in that many other people have launched or enhanced their careers based on their experience with Louis or his training system. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying that it's true. When you're going through the course of editing the movie over the last however long it's been mm-hmm. that you've that it's taken to edit it, were there patterns and things that occurred to you in watching it, in watching all the footage that maybe hadn't occurred to you while you were while you were shooting everything? There were. I'm tr- I'm trying to think of what sort of specific things um, and what things don't like give away a lot in the movie. One of the like sort of early conflicts was. A lot of people wondered why 
we spoke to some of the people that we spoke to. Okay. Especially, you know, a, a lot of sort of the older lifters with some of the, you know, some of the guys that we, in powerlifting and especially in Westside, everybody doesn't get along. Yeah. A lot of people straight up hate each other. Yeah. And, you know, I would get a phone call every once in a while saying like, you talk to this guy? And I'd say, well, you have to understand that guy is important to, you know, there's multiple facets of the gym. Mm -hmm. Some people, while they may have had really bad endings there, there might still be bad emotions. They were important to the board. They were important to the numbers. Uh Some people, they weren't important to the numbers. They, you know, and in talking to Louie, Louie might get upset that you ask about them, but they were important to the fabric of the gym. Some people, they were important only in terms of what they caused Louie to do or what they caused someone else to do. Mm-hmm. You know, they were important from a relationship standpoint. And not, not in, when I say important, I don't mean in a positive way. Right. I mean that they're not being, you know, their being there caused some shift in the gym that was impactful. Sometimes that caused the gym to go up. Sometimes it caused it to go down. Sometimes it ripped the gym apart. Sometimes it motivated Louie. Sometimes it it turned Louie into something that was difficult for everyone. And that was even when I was questioning Louie, there were things that he didn't understand why I was asking him questions about certain people. He didn't understand why I was asking him questions about certain things. Because and it it's reflective of like what his values are that, you know, he's like, Well, why do you want to know about them? They were never even on the board. Right. Why do you want to know about them? They were never they never they were never one of my top performers. And I think, you know, I think that that's sort of in a weird way, like uh, that goes back to sort of like him and Dave Tate. Yeah. Was that at that time, I don't think he, he valued Dave was someone who was much more important to the rest of the world and West side mm. than he was inside West side. That's what I've picked up. That's an interesting point. I, I think that if Dave Tate wasn't at West side, West side, the gym may have been virtually the same, but the impact of West Side would have been far different. And and that's something that I, I think with Louis that he's not concerned about outside of the gym, especially at that time. It, and he doesn't go outside of the gym. He goes home, he goes to the gym. He drives a nice car to get from home to the gym. <laughs> but you look at it, you know, they, they sell a lot of stuff at Westside now. Westside makes money now. Mm-hmm. But if you look at the last time I interviewed Louie, he was wearing a champion sweatshirt from Walmart with a hole in it and food stains. He was wearing Nikes that had a hole in the bottom of them. He was wearing cargo shorts that looked like, you know, they were probably 20 years old. Yeah. And he was wearing, underneath it all, he was wearing a shirt from a gym that somebody had given him like 10 years ago. This is a guy who could live a completely different lifestyle if he chose. And yet he chooses to live as though he is verging on absolute poverty. Poverty, yeah. And he chooses to live almost really like he's in prison where he has the same daily routine. He chooses to do that despite all of his success. And yet people, people, you know, criticize him and wonder why hasn't he done all of these things in reaction to how the culture has changed. He doesn't see what's on the internet. Mm-hmm. He doesn't see what happens five minutes. So he doesn't see what goes on at the Arnold. Mm-hmm. He only sees what happens at his house and what happens in his gym he doesn't see any of the rest of it. So people are, you know, people come in and they, they tell him stuff and they ask him stuff about how the rest of the world operates. He hasn't been a part of the rest of the world since, you know, I would say since 1976. Truth be told, he doesn't know how big or how small Westside is. 
there's there's nothing to frame the concept the context of West Side against for him. It's it's his entire existence and there's there's nothing outside of that. Do you think we may or may not use this? Do you think that like how he dresses and stuff in the gym has anything to do with not wanting to make anybody else in the gym feel uncomfortable about it's like is he is he doing it to blend in? Or is he just not no, care? No, I mean, I went through I went through thousands of photos, and and there's you know hundreds of them in the in the documentary. You can look back; he dresses the same way now that he dressed he in has. 1966. Yeah, you know he 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 dresses like you know a poor kid from the west side of Columbus. And strangely enough, that's what he is. Yeah, he just has. He's actually, he's actually a poor kid from the east side. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. It was after you know in the story, or in the movie, you know, like he he gets kicked out of school. Oh, okay. He got kicked out of school uh, for hitting a teacher when he was six years old, and it was you know so traumatic to the teacher and the school. His family was on the east side at the time. No school would take him in that year, wow. so he had to sit out a year. And this happened on like the third day of school. Oh my god! So after three days, he's kicked out of school, but his own school said they wouldn't take him back. So he was straight up so expelled. He, he was, oh yeah, he was straight up expelled as a six-year-old. As a six-year-old, straight up expel, expelled, and then on the west side, a school uh, said that they'd take him in. Wow! So his family moved to the west side, and that's you know when the family moved because of him. That's that's my understanding of it. Wow. Um, that's crazy. you know. We don't have any of the details here, but am I the only one who's thinking this might have been a little bit of an overreaction on the part of the school district? I mean, did he hit her with something? How bad could it possibly have been? I just think maybe things were different 64 years ago. So you went on your own sort of hero's journey in editing this film, I feel like. Not just shooting it, but the actual actual editing process. What did that take and what did it take out of you? And when were you finished with this version of the film? <laughs> well, so we had we had roughly 200 hours of footage, mostly interviews. And again, to go back to when people ask, like, why do movies take so long? Why do documentaries take so long? Documentaries, they cost less to make than any other movie, but they take more time to make than any other movie. You shoot people telling these stories for 200 hours, and then you have to whittle 200 hours down to an hour and a half. But just, so just, if you just think about like the logistics of that, 200 hours, first you have to line up 200 hours worth of audio. Yeah. And 200 hours worth of video. So that's, that's five weeks right there of, of just lining up stuff. Then to actually watch it so that you can absorb it and go, okay, what did we get? Because you remember bits and pieces, but you, you can't remember everything. Yeah. So that's five weeks of 40-hour weeks, you know? Four weeks if you're working 50 hours, <laughs> you know? But but so it, it takes, I mean, it takes like m- several months just to listen through everything. Yeah. And wrap your head around it. And then you start to whittle it down and, you know, you're trying to get like 200 hours down into some manageable time frame, you know, like, and you get 200 down into 40 Mm-hmm. And now you've got the now you've sort of got the ingredients to do all these different storylines, right? Um, and you have to pick which ones you actually feel like are the most complete, or the most appealing, or the most informative, or yeah. So so then forty hours eventually gets down to like in this case it got down to seven, and now I had everything laid out in these kind of you know it was like okay well here's the things that are most entertaining and interesting to me but it's still it's seven hours long yeah and then you you know you you start to go okay well all right let's let's try and trim all these things down into you know the most sort of streamlined versions of themselves Uh and now it's three and a half hours long then you start to go well this storyline and this storyline are really redundant yeah especially with this project louis is kind of always you know louis is always louis 
he changes, but it's not, they're not drastic changes. Mm -hmm. They're these like minor adaptations to, to help get him through. And then everyone who's coming in, you know, they don't really change. They're different people, Mm -hmm. you know, but like he's 43 and some young 20 year old kid comes in and he makes them great. And eventually they, you know, they're a 26 year old kid and they're going, you know what? I don't want the same things that I wanted when I was 20. Right. And Louis going, I still want the same things that you wanted when you were 20, <sighs> you know? And, and so they're trying to, they're trying to struggle with that. And they're like, you know, Louis shouldn't want these things for me anymore. Or Louis should be understanding. And Louis's like, I'm still the same dude, mm-hmm. you know? And so it's these, it, what I found is sort of these people change around Louis. And Louis sort of like his curse almost is that he doesn't change. And that's what makes it so hard. So eventually things blow up with that person. The next guy comes in Mm -hmm. and it's some young wide eyed kid who, you know, or it's some, you know, maybe it's a guy in their thirties who's, you know, had a rough past too, but same thing happens. Like even the guys who understand Louis, eventually they get old (laughs) <laughs> yeah they they get old and it, louis sort of louis allowed to get old but no one else really is right and so eventually they can't get on the board anymore eventually they're not competitive anymore and so then it's like well what do you contribute to the fabric of the gym and for some of those guys you know okay well louis lets them train kind of in you know in off hours Mm-hmm. Um, like say like George Halbert, mm-hmm. you know, he still trains at Westside, but he trains at like three thirty in the morning. What? Yeah, just I didn't to know that. He, he looks great in the movie, by the way. Yeah, he 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 looks like he's you know him and Kenny. Yeah, Kenny looks uh, a million times better than yeah. I've, than I've seen Kenny look when he was already looking better from how he looked at when he was at Westside. Yeah, but so you you just see that like sort of the one of the central kind of overriding conflicts was that every year Louis is older and it's it's like a it's like this bizarro dazed and confused situation where instead of Matthew McConaughey going you know like yeah I keep getting older and they stay the same age <laughs> you've got Louis going you know like um you know he's he was 43 and he's complaining about relating to you know 23 year olds uh-huh. Then he was 53, and he was complaining about relating to 23-year-olds. Uh-huh. Then 63, and he was complaining about relating to 23-year-olds. <laughs> and now he's 70. And he, you know, like, so he started to, along the way, kind of appreciate a little more those people who were the translators. Uh, yeah. Uh, at the further removed he's gotten. Because it, it gets harder and harder for him every year, you know, to be... To, to be three times older than your athletes and, you know, try to relate with them and then for them to try to relate with you. And mm-hmm. most of them know nothing about your career. Right. Cause it was so long before them. It seems like ancient history. Yeah. 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 So they're, you know, their, their parents grew up telling them about you when you were already old. Like you were, you're literally old enough to be their grandparent. Mm-hmm. And, Yet he's still trying to get you to, you know, perform for him, and he's still trying to command your respect, and he's he's still trying to pull something out of you. Mm-hmm. But it's it's so hard because he has no, and because he's so cut off from the rest of the world, he doesn't know what life is like for young people anymore. Mm-hmm. It it makes no, their lives make no sense to him. He come, you know, they come in and talk about, they show him their phones and stuff the the phones don't make any sense to him he doesn't know his phone number <laughs> okay he wow yeah like he wow because his phone he and he's told me before my phone number is not going to help me move a number on the board oh my god my phone number is not on the board why do i need to know my phone number oh my god that's great were there any points that you regretted having done this thing having started down this road um to, to the point that maybe you thought about checking it it's, I thought about this the other day, uh, cause I was explaining this project's gotten to a point where, um, especially with 
some of the things I can't talk about. <laughs> right. Um, it got to a point where literally I I wrote down some of the hard parts about making this, and I was like blown away by what I had it, to see it on paper. Uh-huh. And I just went, I'm an idiot. <laughs> I I I I like. I thought, how can you explain this to someone? How can you justify this to someone? Because there's there's been a lot of points where, like, I legitimately have been concerned about, like, my own sanity mm-hmm. in making this. That's not, like, joking around or anything. Like, I've, I've literally been like, do I have the grip on reality that I think that I do? Because I look at this and I go, like, if if someone came to me with this list of problems... Mm -hmm. i don't know i i wouldn't even help them i would say you're you're you clearly have a problem with (laughs) the situations that you put yourself in yeah and i look back and you know like i'm i'm 31 now and you know like now i have a i have a, a a steady girlfriend and i'm in a very sort of stable romantic and an emotional place and I, I live in a different... I, when I started doing this, I was living in a house with four other guys. <laughs> yeah. It, you know, so I was living in this like weird frat house place and I was in just this atmosphere in, in Hollywood with all these like man children who <laughs> who all were like Peter Panning and no one wanted to grow up and, and like there was no consequence and it was wild. And, yeah. and even though I'm still working on the same project... I realized, like, I don't think I'm at a place in my life where I could start this again. Um, I don't, and and I'm not that much older, but I feel like I've gone through so much. I have so much more gray hair. <laughs> that's, a, that's great. I yeah. can't, when I started, you know, when I started this, I wasn't working out that hard, and I was 215 pounds. Now I'm 270. You know, like I am a I'm a, a f- different person, physically, mentally, emotionally, in so many different ways. Uh, without like changing really the core of what I am, but I was just like, I don't, and because that's also a fascinating thing that I've I've found with with the lifters, and I've told a lot of lifters, you know, one of the things that Dave Hoff says at the end of the movie, like I've told him, you know, like I get choked up every time I watch it because what he's talking about, he's talking about the struggles that he went through in trying to. Re, you know trying to recapture that like zenith of of powerlifting yeah. and trying to trying to best 3005 you know and he he eventually does it but it, it just barely right. he five, moves his total 5 pounds 5 pounds yeah but to him it you know like to a lot of people they would look at it and go like it's just 5 pounds it took you that long to to do just a two and a half on each side across three lifts. It took you four years to find one lift that you could put two and a half pounds on either side of the bar. You get kind of like a complex about like, and he's, he's a young kid. He's about my age and it's the weirdest. It's this is not a thing I ever thought that like, Oh, I'd have this like weird, empathetic relationship to to like dave hoff's Dave problems. Hoff, yeah you know like uh because we're we're vastly different in a lot of ways mm-hmm. um but to hear him talk about it i was like this he's he was going through while we were doing the movie he was going through a lot of the same problems like with the rest of his life that i was going through and he was going through the same sort of like insecurities of you know you did this thing when you were younger that got you, you know, people gave you a claim for it mm-hmm. and people looked at you a certain way and it, it, it defined you in a certain way. For him, it was 3005. For me, it was, it was editing forks over knives. Mm-hmm. It was then becoming an editor at NFL network. It was then, you know, becoming a producer on a travel channel show. And it was, and right around the same time that like Dave suddenly couldn't get through a meet Right around that same time, I suddenly couldn't get a job. Yeah. I was, you know, I like, if this had all, you know, not worked, I'd be back in Florida living, you know, in my childhood bedroom and coaching JV football at my old high school. 
that would be my life. And that would be, you know, not to say that that's, there's anything necessarily wrong with that. But it's not but, what you had in, in mind. Yeah, but it's not what I had in mind. And it's not, more importantly, it's not what I knew that I was capable of. And in powerlifting, you know, like there's that very real sense of like, for, for Hoff, of knowing that you you could do better. And knowing that as young as you were, that everyone thought that you were going to do better. You know, to to he came in as like a 13 year old or 14 year old kid right to say i'm going to be the i'm going to be the strongest guy who's ever come through the gym i'm going to put up the biggest number that any human being has ever put up people would have said that you were crazy but he went and he did it and then when he did it everyone thought my god what's he going to do next and then nothing happened i went through the same thing where like family members told me you know for years don't do film they told me, go play football, because playing college football was more realistic to the people I grew up around. <laughs> yeah. Chasing the NFL was more realistic, and I, I don't have the frame and the, the skill to, you know, I never had that. I could have been a, you know, a bench warmer on a, you know, low-level D1 football team, but, you know, I could have gone out there and just ran into people on special teams, <laughs> but... I wasn't anything great, but that was more realistic to the people around me than pursuing film. Mm -hmm. So I had gone through this thing where I had like to convince everyone around me that I had what it took to do this. And then I got back to a point where I felt like not really through fault of my own, you know, in the same way that Hoff like suddenly dealt with injuries this isn't in the film, but he suddenly was dealing with injuries that he couldn't figure out. And I think with him, there's a very real concern of like, I might be robbed at this young age of this thing that I told the world I was going to do, mm -hmm. then overcame the odds to actually do it. And just as everyone started to believe it, I might not ever have that back again. Mm -hmm. And... I was like, I had a, I had a very rapid ascent among the people that I went to LA with. I did very well, very quickly and thought that I was going to, you know, be on this much different trajectory. And then in my mid twenties, shit got really hard. And everywhere I went, people would tell me like, oh, you're great to work with. And you know, you got a lot of talent, you got a lot of promise, but I couldn't find the opportunities. And, it, it, you know, to hear, like, him talk about his struggles felt so reminiscent of what I had gone through, of feeling like you know that you've got it in you to do something bigger and better. And you feel like you owe it to so many, you know, he felt like he owed it to, to people like Bob Coe, who mm -hmm. had believed in him. I felt like I had owed it to people, you know... <laughs> Now it happens. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so now, uh, for those of you at home, well, uh, now with tears in my eyes, as I realize like what I'm saying, I felt like I had owed it to, you know, the people who I had met along the way who did believe in me, mm. you know, um, you know, like my parents, you know, my girlfriend, my girlfriend's parents, mm -hmm. you know, people like you, people, you know, people who I felt like saw the talent that I always believed was there myself, who expressed to me that they saw it too. And... I but I I still couldn't figure out how to make it work. And that was one of the things that you know when I walked into doing this and saying everything that was was sort of, you know, up against me in in doing it, one of the reasons why I was willing to walk through it was because I felt like if I can't make this work, then I can't do this anymore. So it was just, that was, my only option was I either have to make it work or I have to get used to the idea that this is not who I am. 
and I, you know, like to know, to know a hundred percent that you can do something yeah, and feel like you should be doing it. And to know that like, if you fail, even though it's not that I did something wrong, but that it's, if I failed, it would have been because of some decision that I had made along the way, or maybe something that I could have done and didn't. I think everyone gets wrapped up in what they do wrong. I've never done, you know, and to say like, do you have any regrets? I have never had any, I've never had any regrets in making this. Because even the things that have, even the things that have, that have hurt, you know, even with the things that I can't talk about Mm -hmm. that have hurt, uh, things that, you know, like have to hire lawyers and stuff over that have hurt. Mm Mm-hmm. Those things that hurt, they slowed me down, but because they slowed me down, it it made the timing of certain other things. You know, guys came back to the gym and right. created the endings that, you know, I was looking for and the endings that I needed. If I hadn't have had all those obstacles in the middle, I would have finished a year earlier and I would have missed that ending. If I hadn't have had all those obstacles... I wouldn't have finally gotten to the point where Louis kind of let his guard down enough to give me some really good stuff. Mm. I wouldn't have I wouldn't have gotten to the point where I was so, you know, worn ragged that I had edit sessions where I kind of just went into a zone and blacked out and woke up, you know, <laughs> <laughs> woke up crying but with some with some uh, like with a, you know, specifically with the ending of the movie, which is the part that, you know, where I think everything starts to hit people. The last eight minutes of this movie are a masterpiece, everybody. I'm just going to say that. Yeah. But that, that wouldn't have happened. Yeah. Without, you know, without things that put me on the edge of a panic attack constantly. Mm -hmm. Like, so even the stuff that like I'm still dealing with Mm -hmm. now that the movie is basically done. Which is because it still has to go through color correction and, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. audio mastering and yeah, stuff. Yeah. And we're going to swap out a couple of the music pieces to fix some of the pacing. But, mm-hmm. like, it's, you can watch the movie and it's 99% there. Yeah, for sure. But without all of that, like, this wouldn't have timed out that way. Mm-hmm. And it's something where you look at, like, like this could, it couldn't even happen, like, circumstantially or, or coincidentally that way like it's it's as if like at every time i thought that i was just gonna absolutely fall on my face things just kind of it's like there's a cosmic force just you know like almost crafting like a a great story out of me whether for people that's you know a sense of religion or philosophy or or whatever that's what it felt like i said something a long time ago and when I said it, someone asked me, like, where'd you get that from? And I was like, I just made it up. <laughs> I thought it sounded cool. As I said, like, believe not in fate, but have faith in destiny. And I just said it because I thought it sounded poetic and stuff. But what it, what I meant by saying it was that in life you fall into things that are, when we think of fate, it's, it's often it's a negative. Right, yeah. It's, it's a certainty and it's, it's a doom that people... <laughs> right you know, succumb to, they don't want it, but to say, believe, you know, believe not in fate, but have faith in destiny. Destiny is something that when people talk about it, even though the word like literally, they mean virtually the same thing, the connotation of it, everything else that comes with it is a sense that destiny is something that you rise up to. You have to rise up to meet it and it's never easy. Right. You know, it's a it's a potential, it's an opportunity that you have that's right there. And, and, you know, you have to, like, be brave enough or be persistent enough to reach up and take it. And fate kind of falls down upon you. Right. So... Fate is the sword of Damocles that's mm-hmm. hanging over your head. Yeah. So I say, like, you know, I don't, I don't believe that I'm fated to anything. Mm-hmm. I don't. I don't believe that you know, absent of work, that anything's going to come to me, and I don't believe that anything is inescapable. 
And like there were a lot of points within making the movie, especially within the last couple <laughs> months, within the last couple of weeks. Yeah. Within at the very right. end, beginning of this. Days. Yeah. Within the very beginning of this, I don't want to leave this out. One of the first things that you said as we hit record was, uh, we'll get into when did you actually finish this movie? <laughs> um, I watched the movie for the first time all the way through the version that we screened. I watched it for the first time in the theater. Last night. Last night. And you finished it at? I finished it the day before at 3 a.m. So I finished it February 28th, Wednesday morning at 3 a.m. I had a flight out at 2. I had to leave for the airport at 11.30. And it took five hours for the movie to export. (sighs) So, I did not watch it <laughs> until you got into the theater. Until, and I mean, even before it was exported, I did not watch this movie front to back <laughs> until the theater, which is the most terrifying thing <laughs> I've ever fucking done. <laughs> and one thing that I wanted to say, I was going to say it to you right before we hit record, but I hate when people um, talk to you as you're setting up your equipment. Um, cause that's often I find when people say like the best, the shit, best shit yeah, and then they like, you know, kind of put on a, a face and try and, right, right, they, right. they try and present themselves as like more formal and, and put together as soon as you hit record and just ruin all the momentum that you just had. <laughs> I wanted to say like the scariest part of that first screening was when I walked up to the front of the room afterwards. Uh You know, the whole time I'm on pins and needles and I was like, if nothing else, I know that I have those laugh lines in there. Right. I know that. And I was like, that's the only, you know, like I'd hear and the first one, like didn't get much of a laugh. It's like a couple people. And I was like, okay, well, I'm just, it's like tickling you. Like, I'm just Uh trying to get like a little bit of a reaction there, but hopefully it'll build. And then there were a couple that like didn't hit right. And, and then at the end, you know, like I'm looking around, I'm, I'm looking around, trying not to cry myself, and looking around to see like who else looks choked up. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Through the light reflecting off the screen, I'm going like, "Am I?" You know, I'm just looking for feedback and validation. <laughs> and somebody throw me a bone. Yeah, and then there's a little bit of clapping when it ends. Oh yeah, we didn't. I didn't have time to put credits on the end. Right. So, so we, the film just so, cuts to black, and the music fades out. And I don't think people, because I use that, I like to cut to black a lot uh-huh. uh, and just harsh cut, uh-huh. um, not not a slow fade or anything. Like I like to stop the, you know, to stop the car by slamming my foot on the brake, basically. Uh-huh. And so the movie ends very abruptly, um, and where the credits would come up to kind of give you that release to say like, okay, this the ride is over now, uh-huh. they don't. And then the house lights come on after like 10 <laughs> seconds and everyone is kind of silent. And I walked down to the front of the theater and of course I sat like my, I sat by my family. So they sat me up way higher than I would have wanted to be. <laughs> um, and in the middle of the row, so I have to walk by everyone. I'm hoping people <laughs> don't just get up and start walking out of the theater before I can say something at the end. And I walk up to the front and I, I pick up the mic and I, I you know say a couple words and there were a couple people who shouted some things. Uh-huh. But then everyone just went silent. <laughs> and I'm I'm just like nervously talking, trying to trying to, you know, uh-huh. thank everyone for coming and say like, you know, this meant and I'm also trying not to cry my eyes out. Yeah. And as I'm doing that, I look up and I just see like blank faces and no one's making any noise. And I say like, you know, okay, well we have some time for questions. One guy raises his hands and he asks, he raises his hand and he asked a question that like, just told me like, okay, you don't really know a whole lot about West side. All right. Yeah. Um, and everyone else there's like West side OGs and stuff. And, <laughs> I'm looking up and I, I know that there's like 30 guys there who are from West Side, uh-huh. like sort of the older generations, and no one's saying anything. We had a Q&A at the premiere <laughs> of the movie and there was one question. And it was it was a question that was like, 
a frustrating question as a filmmaker because it also didn't give me the there was no room to elaborate to like right yeah, it yeah. was a question that i couldn't really answer for a yeah. lot of different reasons um and it didn't lead to any other further questions so i was just like did y'all fucking hate it like what <laughs> I was just like so it, that. Like that's your worst fear is oh, yeah, you just exactly. put everything out there and you got no response. Yeah, I'm familiar with that uh, that kind of concern. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then everyone came down and kind of one by one, like all you know, said like good job. And uh -huh. the guys who had been to the gym came down and you know, like half of them. And these are these are old school. Like these these are guys from the roughest generation. And they came up and shook my hand and said, you know, like, thank you. Yeah. And one guy came up and just without, didn't say a word to me, just gave me a hug. Aww. One guy came and, you know, one guy kind of waved to me and he was a guy who was in the movie. Mm -hmm. It was a legendary figure at Westside and, you know, a terrifying figure at Westside. And I could see he was still choked up and he just kind of nodded his head and gave me a thumbs up and it was such a relief yeah. because there was a moment there where I, I, I was just like, I have never, I, I've never I, seen a reaction like this. <laughs> I, I've never, I'm not prepared for this. It's like, this is the biggest bomb ever. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Michael. Well, thank you very much. Can you do me just a favor? Thanks to my good friend, Michael, for being on the show and letting me be involved in the tiniest way in this process. His documentary is outstanding. Thank God he made it instead of letting me talk him out of it. As Michael said in this episode, the name of the movie came from something I said. The name of this episode came from something Louis said about Michael. He said Michael had a lack of sensible quit. His unwillingness to quit in the face of all those obstacles served him and the rest of us quite well. You can find the film at westsideversustheworld.com. That's Westside vs the world.com and on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook as Westside Film, all one word. If you have questions about how you can see the film, please direct those to Michael. Don't ask me, I don't know. On the next episode of the Less Than Obvious podcast, Hate Brand Goods founder Mike Beach talks about the pressures of being a serial entrepreneur when your first job is being a stay-at-home dad. Yeah. I'm sitting here with you right now because I helped to build Hate Brand Goods. And, yeah. And then it's succeeding. It's doing well. Right. I'm sitting here with you because of that. That's what people are going to know if they, like the six people that recognize my name are going to know. <laughs> They're going to know that that's what I'm about. None of them are going to know about the catering company. None of them are going to know about being director of sales at an app Well, they are now, but... No. <laughs> <laughs> I may not have canceled that with that hosting subscription. It might still be out there, so I shouldn't say too much. You know, they're not, you know, they're not going to know about the, um, the consulting firm. They're not going to mm. know about the, the, the recruitment agency. They're not going to know about all those sunk ships. Mm. They're not going to know about all this stuff. But I have to eat every one of those failures. Financially, mm -hmm. I, and... Uh, in my ego for personally, I have to eat every one of those failures. And it's very easy to romanticize entrepreneurial uh, entrepreneurs that say like, you know, you fail until you don't, you know, I've failed a hundred times before I succeeded. And it's really easy to romanticize. Yeah. But it's an ass kicking. It sucks to suck. <laughs> <laughs> and so we, t and I talked about sucking at sports and sucking at, you know, like um, ideas or philosophical things, being mm. not good at those. When you talk about, as, and look, there are some cultural things tied to this that are so heavy, but a man that fails at earning, oh man. Yeah. It, it sucks, and it should not be a thing, but you and I both know it's a thing. Please leave a five-star review on iTunes if you're liking what you hear. You can find the website at lessthanobviouspod.com. All the platforms I know the show is on are listed there. You can find the show on social media at Less Than Obvious on Instagram and Facebook and Less Than OBV on Twitter. I'm at the Jim McD everywhere, and I'll talk to you next time.